As was said, I'm writing a book at the moment called Lands of Likeness, which is a kind of imbrication of contemplation in its new, older and newer forms. And the chapter, which I'm going to read a bit from today, has actually got four parts. The first part, I talk about the classical, patristic, and medieval background to contemplation, which I'll say just a, a word or two, because this is a classical school. Do you know it all, right? The second part is on the Windhover, which I'll read today. The, uh, I'll read the poem, and I'll talk about the poem. The third part, which I won't read, is on what I call the hermeneutics of contemplation, which is something likely to get me lynched, because I'm seeking to replace the hermeneutics of suspicion with the great heroes of the American Academy, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, with a new tri triumvirate of Coleridge, Schopenhauer, and Husserl on contemplation. And then the final part is on what happens to this tradition of contemplation in poetry after Hopkins, specifically with regard to birds. And that's to, to do with some more modern poems and, and nature writing. And my thesis there, just so you know it, is that we lapse from contemplation proper into a state of fascination. We move from that which is free to that which is constrained. But that's a whole thesis that I'm happy to talk about in question time, if you wish, but I'm not going to be talking about in the bulk what I talked about today. Let me just say one or two words about the first part of the talk, which I won't be reading in any detail. Contemplation, as we inherit in the Latin West, of course comes from the Latin word templum. And the templum, as I'm sure you know, is that part towards the north of the Forum in Rome where the College of Augurs would go in order to see if there were good auspices for spring crops, for military success, wherever the Romans wanted to bash someone, and so on and so forth. And the, there are many different ways of getting auspices, but the most common of them was to draw a square in the sky, the Templum, and to see, in very complicated ways I won't go into, if birds came from the east or the west, the north or the south, and what sort of birds they were. The prize catch was, of course, an eagle, because it was Jupiter's bird. The early Christian church took up the notion of the templum in the word contemplatio. In fact, it was Cicero who coined the word. Um, but they took, early Christian writers took that up, and also the notion of birds flying into the templum. So we find Gregory the Great in his enormous Moralia in Job, 1,800 pages in Latin, commentary on Job. This is what we call slow reading or close reading. <laughs> I like to think of it as tortoise-like reading. Uh, the pseudo Dionysius, who I think is something of a hero at Hillsdale College, is that right? <laughs> the baseball caps with I love Dennis. You know. um, pseudo Dennis early on takes this up. Uh, becomes in some ways dominant in his interpretation with regard to um, birds in the air. Later on in the Middle Ages with the bestiaries and avariums that you find Hugh of Huillois, for example, talking about various sorts of birds as they relate to prayer. Richard of St. Victor, one of my favorite medieval writers, has a beautiful passage in De Arche Mystica about this, where the birds of the air hovering in the air, suspending themselves, become an image of the contemplative soul in prayer before God. And he talks about the various experiences, the various modes of contemplation that we can have. Uh, Delatio mentis, the uh, expansion of the mind. Sub uh, Sublevetio mentis, the raising of the mind an excessus mentis, the going out of one's mind in um, mystical uh, adoration. So that's all in the background of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I want to read a poem by Hopkins in a space that is opened by precisely these patristic and medieval traditions. And I want to take into account, insofar as it's reasonable, the classical inheritances. How inward Hopkins was with this tradition is hard to specify at all narrowly. His training as a Jesuit was centered on the writings of Suarez, 
an early modern scholastic. And the readings he heard while in refectory were drawn from the rules of the society and spiritual texts that were in favor at the time by Claude Colombier and Frederick Faber, for instance, which by and large we find unreadable today. So he didn't have read in a refractory, and we know what was read each day to him. He, was, he didn't have read to him any of the church fathers, the schoolmen, or the great Catholic contemplatives. The history of dogma was not a prime study in the English Jesuit uh, uh, course of study in the Victorian era. Nonetheless, Hopkins would have passively absorbed some of the tradition, and the metaphors for contemplation were quite familiar in Catholic religious orders. As early as October 1865, he writes a poem, which you probably know, Let me be to thee as the circling bird. And after a period of characteristic Protestant recoil from ascetic practices, nicely embodied in Tennyson's satiric St. Simeon Stylites, a certain Victorian medievalism comes apparent in his other lyrics. And remember that Hopkins learned Greek and Latin at school and was perfectly fluent in both by the time he went to Oxford, where he studied greats, that's to say, classics. And if you've done that much Greek and Latin, you're certainly not going to know about auguries and the traditions of auguries. Of course, Hopkins refashions what he's absorbed to his own ends, beginning with his choice of a falcon rather than a hawk or eagle. Now, the falcon appears far less often in bestiaries than hawks or eagles, mostly because it is not a biblical bird. It's once translated uh, 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 from, from the Hebrew. Uh, the, the word falcon appears in one or two translations, but this is what we call in the academy a mistake. <laughs> Nonetheless, throughout the Middle Ages, it was greatly prized, the falcon, as an emblem of nobility, which serves Hopkins' purposes well. The bird appears in a sonnet, the Windhover, composed on May the 30th, 1877, just outside the seminary where he was studying. And I'll read it, although you probably know it by heart. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, and striding high there, how he hung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air pride plume, here buckle. And the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it. Sheer plod makes plough down silly and shine, and blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. Well, the lyric has been subject to a great many analyses, although to be sure it's not benefit from the sort of slow reading or tortoise-like reading one finds Gregory the Great attempting in the Moralia in Job. It would be interesting to see how long a discussion the poem would justify, especially a reading that took the poem's genesis into account. One person in a learned note says that he has 17 notebooks devoted to the poem. My task is far more modest, for I wish merely to identify the motif of contemplation in the poem and to follow it for a while, being attentive to what might come from it. Hopkins himself writes, most likely in 1873 or 1874, poetry is speech framed for contemplation of the mind by the way of hearing, or speech framed to be heard for its own sake and interest even over and above its interest in meaning. <laughs>
Now, no theological meaning is to be supposed here, but it's plain that for Hopkins, both the intellectual and material dimensions of language are in play in any contemplation of poetry or poetry as an act of contemplation. Yeats says something related to this remark in an essay of 1900, although we need to keep in mind here and throughout that his metrical practice is markedly different from Hopkins. The purpose of rhythm, it has always seemed to me, Yeats says, is to prolong the moment of contemplation, the moment when we are both awake and asleep, which is the one moment of creation, by hushing us with an alluring monotony while it holds us waking by variety, to keep us in that state of perhaps real trance in which the mind liberated from the pressure of the will is unfolded in symbols. Now we could spend a long time simply commenting on those two different accounts of contemplation in poetry, but I won't be doing that today. Now, as you well know, Hopkins does not incline to monotony in his prosody, far from it. Even so, one can be entranced by his sprung rhythms, his wordplay, and the music of his lines. The material dimension of language, its rhythm and vocal play, can be as important to contemplation when reading poetry as its expressive dimension, which bears the meaning of the poem. Yet Hopkins has more than this in mind. He draws out care to poetry's ability, as he says, to carry the inscape of speech for the inscape's sake. Not the inscape of nature, notice, the inscape of speech. And that's something that will interest us a bit later. Also, not said here by either Hopkins or Yeats, the indicative dimension of language, its capacity to motivate empirical associations, whether natural or conventional, can also play a role in the ever-widening circle of what one beholds as subject and how one does so. Now, if one follows those various things, as I go on to show later in the, in the paper, but not material to be read today, it starts to propose what I call a new hermeneutics of contemplation to be used in the reading of poetry, among other things. Now, Hopkins in the poem catches sight of a kestrel, a smaller sort of hawk, common in Britain, perhaps alerted by its piercing call. Its scientific name is Foco tinnunculus, from tinnulus, shrill. Probably when taking prey back to its nest, voles, mice, larks, shrews, lapwings, thrushes, even slugs. It's seen hunting again, silently hovering over the valley in the morning, and Hopkins allows his eyes to linger on it as it revolves in the air. As the title makes name, he prizes the bird under one of its older regional names, Windhover. There are quite a few names attached to the bird, which fits neatly into the Latin contemplative tradition in a way that its more archaic names and modern names do not. That such a tradition might be summoned is signalled in the liminal space between the title and first line. There we read, after a period of seven years after he, he wrote the poem, to Christ our Lord. And while doing so, we note that it is introduced by a colon in the title itself, which is an unusual practice with the dedication of poems. The colon inflects how we're to read the four words in italics. Note that here the preposition to means dedicated to. There is reasoning, though, also to think of it signaling an approach to Christ, a direction that can and perhaps should be followed, and that in its own way the poem beneath will describe, explain, or enact. Title and dedication, taken together, thus denote that the bird points to the second person of the Trinity. The kestrel would therefore exemplify one or more profiles of how we must be in order to be Christ's minion. It is an imaginative epiphany not of the divine, but of a soul in bliss, which Hopkins aspires to be through his Catholicism and indeed his vocation as a Jesuit. Again, I recall, let me be to thee as the circling bird and have its traditional biblical support from Psalm 11, 1. How can you say to me, nefesh in the Hebrew, which means soul or life, suke 
in the Greek. Flee like a bird to the mountains. So the soul becomes biblically and thus in patristic period and medieval period associated with the bird. And we'll, we'll encounter this a bit later as well. Notice the poem begins, I caught. Any devoted reader of Hopkins will recall his memorable entry for his journal for February the 24th, 1873. All the world is full of inscape, and chance left free to act falls into an order as well as a purpose. Looking out of my window, I caught it. In the random clods and broken heaps of snow made by the cast of a broom. Just note, I caught it. And just as likely, a devoted reader of Hopkins will also remember this entry in his journal of about a year later, September the 10th, 1874. The woods, thick and silvered by sunlight and shade, by the flat, smooth banking of the treetops, expressing the slope of the hill, came down to the green bed of the valley. Below, at a little timber bridge, I looked at some delicate flying shafted ashes. There was one especially of single sonnet-like inscape, between which the sun sent straight, bright, slenderish panes of silver sunbeams down the slant toward the eye and standing above an unkept field of stagged and patchy yellow heads of ragwood. I caught it, Hopkins tells his journal. He grasps what he calls inscape, which we might lightly gloss as the distinctive inner pattern that something of a situation or even a line of poetry shows to a diligent viewer. Now, one of the things, let me just signal this so it becomes clear to you. Some of you, I know, have been reading some phenomenology, Jean-Louis Chrétien, and perhaps others, and you'll understand by your reading that so much of phenomenology is taken up with what Husserl called the gaze, and so much of contemplation is taken up with what the Church Fathers call the gaze, the loving gaze that we, part, we, um, we attend to God and that God attends to us. But what Hopkins is doing in this poem, at least to begin with, which has to be acknowledged, is it's a glance or a glimpse, not a gaze. Two years earlier, in his journal for July the 19th, 1872, he says, At this time, I had first begun to get hold of the copy of Scotus in the sentences in the Barry Library, and was flush with a new stroke of enthusiasm. It may come to nothing, or it may be a mercy from God. But just then, I took in any inscape of the sky or sea. I thought of Scotus. Now, these two sentences have led many readers to associate or even identify inscape and hitchaitis, thisness. But if one reads Scotus's revision of his Oxford lectures, uh, which is, I assure you, no easy thing, one finds little reference to it, and nothing anywhere near the start of a commentary. Now, there's no evidence in anything we have of Hopkins that he read the entire commentary on Lombard sentences. He wouldn't have had the time to do so, I rather doubt, even though he had excellent Latin. But he probably looked through the opening and caught some things. One finds, towards the start of the commentary, however, talk of formalitis or realitas, or intensio or ratio realis. And Hopkins never gives us any reason that he made a full study of Scotus, that he became familiar with the entire commentary. Now, Hichertus marks the singularity of any human being. Scotus is not the only scholastic to talk about singularity, I might add, which is another big issue that we need to think about. The trouble is that, according to Scotus, Echeritus is utterly able to be perceived by human beings. Only God sees what is radically unique in anyone or anything. Perhaps we human beings will enjoy such perception in heaven, but according to Scotus, we certainly won't have it before we get to heaven. On the other hand, formalitas, or realitas, 
which is an intelligible feature of something, can be, can, dis can be discerned if one is sufficiently patient and alert. As the alternative word suggests, these forms are real, existing outside the consciousness of an observer, in things that are being perceived, and they are unable to be separated from that of which they are properties. Yet they are able to produce quite different concepts of whatever it is to which they belong. Such concepts do not tell us the whole of what is intelligible in a phenomenon, nor need they ever be formed. But the possibility of them being formed is objective and cannot be annulled. More finally, a formulatus or realitas is identical with the essence of the thing in question, but is formally distinct from it. In fragment eight of his poem Perifusius, which on nature, Parmenides noted that being has various properties, ungenerated, imperishable, whole, unique, immovable, and complete. He was the first person in the Western tradition to do so. Only in the 13th century, however, perhaps as early as Roland of Cremona, was a distinction drawn between being and the transcendentals. Namely, whatever, by virtue of its generality, cannot be contained in any genus as described in Aristotle's categories. The transcendentals are strictly then transcategorical. We can see the point of the formal distinction when we reflect on the relation of ents with res, unum, bonum, verum, and the other transcendentals. It appeals to the transcendentals we find in logic, as in transgeneric terms, for example, and in other parts of philosophy, like aesthetics, pulchrum, for instance. Each of these properties is ontologically one with being, yet each is formally distinct from it. This sort of distinction was primarily used, especially by Scotus, to clarify the relations of the divine persons in the divine essence. At various predications of perfection made of the deity, omnipotence, omniscience, and so on. And the study of transcendentals, as proposed by Scotus, as he says towards the end of his lectures on Lombard, is itself a practice of theoria, of contemplation. But the transcendentals are not limited to Trinitarian theology. When I view a leaf, for instance, I can see it as one, as good, as beautiful, and so on. These distinctions are not simply logical, they are grounded in reality outside my consciousness. Other people can see them in the same way. Nor are the distinctions real, since I cannot actually separate the unity of the leaf from its being, its goodness from its being, and so on. There are distinct formalities in play. My shift of attitude from the one formality to another can occur in an instant, but it's not merely subjective, nor does it change the leaf in any way. It is entirely consistent with realism. The leaf itself allows me to see it in a conceptually distinct way. In the same manner, I'm entitled to see the leaf as having both universal and particular characteristics. It is a leaf sharing the features of all other leaves. But it is this leaf in particular, with let's say a curved edge and a small white blotch on its midrib that I am looking at. Hopkins seems to have extended his understanding of Inscape by acquainting himself with Scotus, and doubtless went further than the 13th century doctrine of the transcendentals, or the older distinction between the particular and the universal. Attracted to bluebells in May 1870, he writes about one that he particularly observed. I do not think I have ever seen anything more beautiful than the bluebell I have been looking at. I know the beauty of our Lord by it. Then he continues. Its inscape is mixed of strength and grace, like an ash tree. The specific mixture of properties held together as one is what absorbs him. To be so taken with a particular phenomenon or situation, he needs, he says, a certain mood to come over him so that the instress could be spotted. 
It is not just that these things, these things were here and but the beholder wanting, as he writes in Hurraring in Harvest in 1877, for the beholder must be motivated to see what is there. Scotus says nothing, nothing about moods in shifting from one formal feature to another. So there's no need to fold Hopkins into Scotus or Scotus into Hopkins. Hopkins uses both of his coinages, in scape and in stress, in 1868, in notes made as an undergraduate on Parmenides Perifusius. So beware. If you become famous in late life, your undergraduate essays will be taken up and published. <laughs> Even your undergraduate notes, your annotations on Dante. <laughs> Everything you write must be perfect now. <laughs> so as a volume we can buy, we can, you can buy now, you're probably in the library, of, of Hopkins' annotations and his undergraduate remarks. He begins one of these essays by paraphrasing the philosopher's central contention that being is and non-being is not. And he does so in his own idiom. He means that all things are upheld by instress and are meaningless without it. It is the first time he uses the words on any page that has come down to us. So he had this language of inscape and instress early on in his undergraduate years, before he read, before he encountered Scotus. On a first pass, instress seems to name a force that maintains things in being, though it's not specified if this force is absolute, objective, or subjective. The word inscape follows shortly after in the same set of notes. And seeking to characterize the philosophy at the root of the poem, he first intends to write, an undetermined idealism runs through the fragments. But he crosses out the word idealism and writes instead an undetermined pantheistic idealism runs through the fragments, the fragments of Parmenides' poem. And adds, which makes it hard to translate them satisfactorily in a subjective or a wholly outward sense. The qualification is intriguing, for in modern terms it turns a philosophical position into a religious one. For Hopkins, a pantheist would maintain that natural phenomena exist by virtue of a particular force one could call divine. Similarly, one might think a Christian would hold that these same phenomena exist because of God's power. The problem translating Parmenides, as stated, is less with the Greek language than with what Perifusius says in this particular case. For being to manifest itself, there must be both a genitive and an accusative, a manifestation of and a manifestation to. The same would be true if one is speaking of God taken as infinite being, as Suarez defines God. Although the modes of manifestation and reception might very well be different from those which a pantheist experiences. Most pantheists do not experience epiphanies of Christ, for example. After these brief introductory remarks on the poem, there comes a memorable sentence with a beautiful, if odd, characterization of Hopkins' insight into Parmenides. I quote, His feeling for instress, for the flush and foredrawn, and for inscape is most striking. And from this one can understand Plato's reverence for him as the great father of realism. So natural phenomena are upheld, maintained in being, by a capacity Hopkins describes as the flush and foredrawn. But only, as he adds a little later in the same set of notes, when one is in a certain mood. Before considering this complex claim, it's worth noting that Hopkins figures Parmenides as an idealist and also as a realist. Now, there's no contradiction for Platonic realism is the view that abstract objects, numbers, concepts, poems, and for a Christian, God, exist irrespective of our beliefs about them. And some of them, numbers and God, for instance, exist even regardless 
of whether or not we exist ourselves or ever have. If the human race weren't created, if God hadn't created anything, there would still be numbers and there would still be God. What attracts Hopkins to Parmenides is the latter's insight into permanent spiritual reality, being in the phenomena of nature. It's worth tarrying with the expression, the flush and the foredrawn. Beginning with foredrawn and taking the risk of rephrasing this beautiful expression in more sober language, though one with roots in Greek. Well observed in a certain frame of mind, a phenomenon seems to draw itself forward into one's sphere of regard, so that its medley of unity and distinctiveness could be noticed, Hopkins suggests. That is, one receives an intuition that can be gained only when one is in an appropriate mood, that makes one receptive to recognizing a peculiar strain of, university, of unity and diversity in a phenomenon. What this mood might be Hopkins does not tell us. It may be tranquility, or it may be one or more moods in a spectrum from thankfulness or joy at one end to anxiety and deep boredom at the other. We may recall Heidegger criticizing Husserl's affirmation of the need of tranquility when doing philosophy and telling us, this is Heidegger telling us, that only particular dark moods that come over us really disclose being to us. And in response, we might ask the great German thinker why the fundamental attunements he discusses, angst, for example, dread of death, deep boredom, <coughs> happen to be on the gloomy side of the psychological spectrum. Can we not see something, a falcon, for example, more richly when in an affirmative mood than a black one? does not an event sometimes shift one's mood from the darker side to the brighter side. Hopkins was well aware that natural phenomena do not simply give themselves as in scape at any time. We must approach them with the right degree of heightened awareness, but even this can lead to problems. In March 1871, he tells his journal, what you look hard at seems to look hard at you hence the true and force in stress of nature. One must educate one's perception of natural things, it seems. Be aware, if you wish, of the realities and formal distinctions, and not allow oneself to slip into a fantasy of natural phenomena having a counterintentionality of their own. And he admonishes himself, unless you refresh the mind from time to time, you cannot always remember or believe how deep the inscape of things is. Retreats, prayer, exercises of attention, and country walks are all in play here. Among other things, for Hopkins, this refreshment would be the difference between saying to oneself, mere nature or creation, in response to what is seen. But it would be a mistake to think that inscape is always pious that it is always the same for each and every observer, or even for the same observer at different times. What is discovered changes, as does the proportion of what one detects in what one sees, or indeed glimpses. Only being which is changeless and permanent can manifest itself in inscape, and only being comports with logos, Hopkins reads lines seven and eight of, the frag of fragment two of the poem. Thou couldst never either know or say, he says, what was not, there would be no coming at it. Language could not even begin to describe non-being, Hopkins thinks. The copula would not function. For, just think about it, as soon as one says, it is, dot, 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 about non-being, one's made an obvious mistake. One's attributed being to it. And you've got to go back and start again. But where can you start again? How are you going to, how are you going to describe something without a copula? So the question has got no viable answer. Now for Parmenides, and for Hopkins, at least Hopkins as a student, being does not arise from non-being, 
It is absolute and has no genesis whatsoever. Even when absent to consciousness, it still is, and as remembered, is present to consciousness, which calls forth the remark, it is the unextended foredrawn. The negative of the foredrawn comes up when Hopkins reads lines 46 to 47 of fragment 7 of Parmenides' poem, which he translates as, nor is there not being which could check it from reaching the same point. Now, Parmenides has been explicating what the goddess has told him of being, that it does not derive from anything and does not pass away. It is perfect, but non-being has no reality whatsoever and therefore cannot interrupt the continuity of being. Hopkins glosses the line and a bit as follows. Not being is here seen as want, as want of oneness. All that is unfordrawn, waste space, which offers nothing either to the eye to foredraw or many things foredrawing away from one another. Sometimes is, something is, only if it is unified. Its inscape can be grasped by consciousness only because it manifests itself, being, and does so in truth. It is the coming forward of a phenomenon when engaged by a vigilant look that prompts Hopkins to recall Plato's reverence for him, Parmenides, as the great father of realism. I hope you notice that I'm still in the midst of explicating the first two words of the poem. And I've got a way to go. So. This is a great competition I'm having with Gregory the Great. <laughs> Who can read the most carefully? The verb flush, which Hopkins also uses with reference to Scotus, is perhaps even more evocative than foredrawn for two reasons. Its association with speed directs us to the phenomenality of the phenomenon, its peculiar manner of appearing. And the word semantic field is extensive. I won't go through all that the OED tells us here, but I'll tell you a couple. Consider the verbal form of flush. To fly up quickly and suddenly, to start up and fly away. To reveal, to bring into the open, to drive. To rush like birds on the wing, expressing sudden movement. To cleanse, to drive away, to emit light or sparks suddenly and so on and so forth. It's a very long entry. Without being fussy about particular meanings here, we might say that Hopkins alerts us to the ways in which a phenomenon discloses its instress and the effect that these have on us. It comes quickly. We see it in a glance, not in a disciplined gaze. And it fills us momentarily, perhaps cleansing or heightening our sense of reality. As he says in a journal entry of December 1872, I love this line, I saw the inscape of the grass he's looking at. I saw the inscape, though freshly, as if my eye were still growing. Wow. Do you write that in your diaries? I mean, it's amazing. This is true in stress, producing an alert looks response to what is real. And part of the reality is the inscape, the distinctive pattern of a thing or a situation that for Hopkins mostly bespeaks divine beauty. What the young Hopkins values in Parmenides is his emphasis on esti, which he renders as it is or there is. But it is suggestive that this disclosure occurs only in particular moods. When that's happened, he writes, he has felt the depth of an instress or how fast the inscape holds a thing, that nothing is so pregnant and straightforward to the truth as simple yes and is. All one can do is affirm what is given to you in the instress. By the time he's writing his mature poetry, Hopkins' sense of inscape is given in terms that are as artistic as they're philosophical. Now, I go on in the actual uh, chapter to talk rather a lot about John Ruskin and what he's taken uh, from John Ruskin, but I'm going to forego all of that. I've been explicating Hopkins' journal entry, February the 24th, 1873, 
and much that I've said applies equally to the journal entry of the following year that I've also quoted. The first thing to notice with this second passage is that on September the 10th, 1874, Hopkins was on coal mining country in South Wales. On the day concerned, the evening of which would mark the beginning of a retreat at his seminary, he was on a pilgrimage rather than being concerned with the social and economic problems of coal miners. He was visiting St Mary's Well. The well is near a ruined chapel and is renowned for the curative property of its waters. Pilgrims have long visited it, even after its desecration had been accomplished by Thomas Cromwell, Chief Minister to Henry VIII in 1538. Hopkins drank water from the sacred spring, the basin of which was, he thought, shaped like the pool of Bethsaida, where Jesus had healed a man who had been an invalid for 38 years. If anywhere, it might have been here, one would suppose, that he would have been disposed to intuit the presence of God. Instead, it's later in the day when he's visiting some rocks, and there he spots one in a group of delicate, flying, shafted ashes. And there he's taken with sonnet-like inscape. The epiphany may well be spiritual, a distinctive pattern that God has given to the ash tree and that Hopkins catches in passing, but it's also aesthetic, which leads one to doubt any strict, continuous distinction between the two when reading him. Divine goodness and divine beauty are convertible after all. One might write a sonnet and in doing so capture something of the inscape of a phenomenon in its language, and in particular in an idiom, which is how I'm translating inscape of speech. This could not happen simply because of the structure of a Petrarchan sonnet, eight lines of an octave followed by a volta, which introduces six lines of a sestet. That pattern is entirely general. But perhaps it could happen if the sonnet were written like no other in its genre, for example, in its concretion of formal, figural, and thematic elements. Its idiom would be absolutely singular, or close to it. With these things in mind, let us return to the Windhover, Hopkins' greatest sonnet, written three years after his visit to St Mary's Well. I caught, I resume my reading, I caught, the octave is cast as recent recollection, Hopkins catching sight of a kestrel. Its appearance and performance are wholly unexpected, and the young Jesuit, just months before his ordination, looks up in wonder and seizes the bird, both with his senses and his mind, at this stage presumably without any awareness of how deeply he will become affected by what he has seen or the direction this affect will take. Suddenness can prompt reduction. All the drama of the rapid glimpse and what unfolds from it can be registered more surely by reminding oneself of Tennyson's fragment, The Eagle of 1846, which of course Hopkins knew and which he talked about in a letter. I'll remind you of the poem, it's very short. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. Close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. Now, the eagle is not glimpsed here. It's encompassed by a look regulated by the natural attitude, the attitude of what we would call in English common sense. Although the fragment is short and visual, it does not promote a poetics of the instant, as one finds in Hopkins and as the Imagists were to develop as part of their program about a century ago. The bird is not made to bear any theme of transcendence or contemplation. Instead, Tennyson looks steadily with admiration at the bird's sovereignty without explicitly introducing himself into the scene. The fragment's drama converges on the last line and especially on its final word. The eagle falls from the crag, moving quickly and powerfully, and we know that it's very likely to be intent on prey. With the Windhover, though, the bird is first given, not in a gaze, but in a glance, which is then stretched into an admiring look of captivation. It is gorgeously drawn out by sprung rhythm 
for six and a half lines. The second line of the octave, for instance, runs to 16 syllables, and the synactic unit of which it is a part crosses three lines, while the following syntactic unit also encompasses three lines, with its full line being a flow of 15 syllables. Hopkins' eyes have swiftly been poured upwards, as I caught suggests, and the notes struck, struck by the ing rhymes, both strong and weak, that govern the entire octave in a singular manner, giving it a dyadic in scape, pitch low and then high. From the beginning we're held aloft in the recounting of the event, and like the poet, attuned to the kestrel's mode of flight. There are several modes, designated by riding, striding, and hurl and gliding. And it will be seen that only the last one inclines to the passivity associated, rightly or wrongly, with contemplation. The first two are equestrian metaphors, a motif that will be picked up in the compacted insight of the reign of a wimpling wing and in the figure of the chevalier. The third is an active verbal noun, the hurl. Taken together, the implication of the four modes is clear. In order to enjoy gliding, the contemplative element, one must first be active. A kestrel lives a mixed life. It's almost a model of the Jesuit vocation. You know, in the, in the religious orders, according to Aquinas, you have the active life, social work of one kind or another from religious purposes, the contemplative life, and for Aquinas, the highest life is the mixed life, which has got elements of both, which the Dominicans have, and later the Jesuits. If the poem's octave makes us think of a templum, we should recognize there's been no anticipation of anything auspicious. The bird's coming into view precedes the poet's awareness of it, and he takes himself to be called to respond. Also, we should record that we would be witnessing what the Romans would have called an oblativa, although it will be of an entirely different character from anything that they defined ex aubus. Even in the mode of perceiving the raptor, though, Hopkins' gaze is extended beyond the realm of the visible to the invisible. He aspires to greater intimacy with Christ in and through the abrupt appearing of the bird. The drench of morning light is compared with the Dauphiné Viennois, ruled by the French king's son from the 11th to the 15th century. The Dauphiné was a wild area of southeastern France, a territory that roughly covered the same terrain as the Departements of Isère, Dôme, and haute alpes do now. The very word minion enters English from Middle French, mignon, at the very end of that period. The French context is almost everything here, for minion must be taken in its 15th and 16th century sense in French, favorite or darling, and not in the sense it came to assume in English in the mid-17th century, that of a subordinate. Christ is the Lord, the King, the Son, whose beams illuminate the Dauphin and allow us to see something of his intimacy with the King. As Hopkins' glance dilates into contemplation, so it takes in the kestrel in its own act of ecstatic joy. As with the birds that Richard of St. Victor sees, it circles in the air, apparently without effort, although the word wimpling indicates that the bird's wings are rippling in folds, like a medieval French nun's headdress in the breeze, as the feathers keep rising and falling in order for the bird to remain in stasis with the wind. So we have two contemplative gazes, one more fully achieved than the other. For the kestrel has complete mastery of his environment, is imminent within it while also transcending it, and he enjoys his free awareness of the world around him and beneath him. Meanwhile, Hopkins contemplates the excessus mentis of the kestrel, its moment of unsayable bliss at the peak of its absorption in the sun before it moves at tremendous speed in quest of its prey. This is the ecstasy of the kestrel. It passes from contemplation to action, and Hopkins sees both. We're not explicitly told that the bird turns its eyes on Hopkins, but the young Jesuit hides from it, 
as a favourite of Christ's, perhaps feeding its eyes upon him like a living icon, or at least internalising the judgement of his community. If we think of Nicholas of Cusa here, who says to Christ, your seeing, Lord, is your loving, we must also take in the full weight of love as agape, recognising that it comes from sacrifice and demands sacrifice in return. Here, in the final lines of the octave, there's less dilatio mentis or sub, uh, sublevatio mentis than oculatio mentis. At the same time, so elated is Hopkins' description of the kestrel that the unwary reader could almost forget the framing dedication for a moment. We see a natural bird, and we also witness a bird that in its freedom and mastery points us to Christ, to the possible intimacy that a soul can have with its king. The description of the bird's sudden swing out of its period of hovering orients us to the kestrel, while the allusions to the kingdom, to the nun's wimple, to ecstasy, and to the king all keep the dedication in mind, both as a dedication and as an orientation. How does it do that? Not as allegory, even though Falcon is granted an initial capital letter. The magic school, along with the French resonance of Falcon, it comes from the old French Falcon, rather than Kestrel, gives the bird a dignity appropriate to the divine person to whom it points. Rather than allegorizing, Hopkins proceeds in a manner the phenomenologists would realize as concretion. The Kestrel is not a token of a general type. Instead, it is charged with meaning because it appears in a particular situation, which comes with the sky as a templum. This meaning, as we've seen, has not been anticipated actively or passively, and Hopkins will take pains to specify it in the sestet. We might say that he already knows that some phenomena exceed any horizon in which they can be manifest, that as a poet, with the question how accompanying each and every perception being embodied in the very rhythm of the lines, he has divined that in some circumstances intuition overflows intentionality. There is no concept that contains both kestrel and blessed soul, and the poem as read thus far conceives something singular in a lyric, even if implicit horizons in scripture, the church fathers and others can be claimed for it namely an illumination of divine intimacy, not simply as phenomenon, but as phenomenality. The bird's how being the conjunction of both the phenomenon of a raptor and the poet's intentional consciousness, which apprehends the phenomenon as both natural and spiritual. That this intentional consciousness reaches beyond the phenomenon, passing from the visible to the invisible, is something we might expect whether we be readers mainly of Husserl or Richard of St. Victor. Intentionality always exceeds its intentional object, the philosopher tells us, while the theologian points to how contemplation has an almost irresistible movement from the visible to the invisible. If we abide with Husserl, we'll say that we have two intentional rays braided together, as it were, in the octave of the poem, perception and belief, the one pointing us to a bird, and the other to an intimacy with the divine as suggested by its movement. Put differently, we pass very quickly by way of a reduction prompted by surprise from the natural attitude, in which a bird is caught at the edge of vision, to the phenomenological attitude in which how it is seen as free, as masterful, as able to achieve what it is created to do, is paramount in an abundant interaction of feet theme figure and form, idiom, or what he calls inscape of speech. Part of that interaction is the ancient idea, pagan, Jewish and Christian, that the soul can fly like a bird. Prudentius, for example, sees the soul flying from the mouth of the martyr Eulalia at the moment of her passion. No surprise then that the poem also adopts the Basileic attitude in which we shift from being oriented to the world, which retains an evident pull on the young Jesuit, to entering the kingdom. For it is only in and through faith in the kingdom and the exercise of hope and love 
that one has the hope of finding the king. How does one enter the kingdom? If it were really like the Dauphiné Viennois, there would really be no need even to pose the question. But as the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels depicts it, the kingdom is a multi-stable phenomenon, at once here and to come, internal and external, strong and weak. One enters the kingdom by faith, it will be said, which is true enough. But the sort of faith that is required, what Augustine and Aquinas agreed to call credere in Deum, believing oneself into God, one could meditate on that for a very long time, believing oneself into God, the Latin says, presumes a stirring of love in order to make an act of faith that is not narrowly intellectual, but is fully embodied. One believes with one's whole being as a thinking, acting, praying person nourished by sacrament, food and deed, not just with one's mind. And the life of faith stretches one backwards to creation as well as forward to life with the saints in glory. That Hopkins takes himself not to be fully in the kingdom is freely admitted. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Contemplation can lead one to transcend oneself, but it can also, almost at the same time, make one pull back in fear because of one's lack of purity. Worldly attachment is a ponderous, as Augustine says. It counteracts the attraction of divine love. The world drags Hopkins back from the kingdom just at the moment that the bird displays its natural prowess, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. It is also the moment when the kestrel, rebuffing the wind, appears cruciform, something done noticed as well. To enter the kingdom of God, one must be purified of sin and must accept the cross. Nothing must be hidden in a supposedly private space. That Hopkins' heart hides from Christ suggests clearly enough that any ascent to God in contemplation meets resistance. Does his heart hide, whether because of impurity or because of an anxiety about the exigency of the cross, taking on permanent vows in just a short time? Or does he have a heart in hiding? Either way, Hopkins not only catches the kestrel in the morning, but also catches himself. A hiding heart and a heart in hiding are not quite the same thing. The former suggests that his heart, the seat of volition, is still partly attached to worldly values. It conceals itself from the bird while also wanting the achievement and mastery that he recognises as fully embodied there. A further act of volition must be made. The latter suggests something slightly different, that the poet has a heart in hiding as well as his everyday heart, that he has a spiritual mode of love that is kept quietly concealed and that has been animated precisely by the jolt of surprise of the bird. Such is what Paul calls the inner man in Ephesians, and that Augustine and the tradition that answers to him, reaching deeply into the Victorines and beyond, teaches. It is this heart behind the heart that perceives the joy that excessus mentis can give that he has still to achieve in his spiritual life as a Jesuit. Both senses are in play. The uncertain will curbs itself and the spiritual sense is inflamed. As a blessed soul, imaginatively manifest as Kestrel, is recognized in the act of embodying its full potential. We may well recall with a chill Richard Lovelace's fine lines. The falcon charges at first view with her brigade of talents. Yet the will can rapidly reach out, as the sestet of the poem tells us. More generally, as Gregory the Great and Aquinas both see, contemplation is not a state of steady tranquility. It's also a response to being wounded by an overwhelming rush of divine glory. One must strive to read a state of beholding God and must strive in order to stay there. There must be both hurl and gliding. 
The heart will not risk itself without knowledge of what it will invest itself in. This protection is traditional and commonsensical. We remember the adage of the schoolman, nihil amatum nisi prius cognitum. I don't need to translate that, do I? Well, you know that? No, of course you don't. We can love something only if we first know it. You yeah? can't love someone unless you know him or her, right? Commonsensical. Not all knowledge that leads to love is as coolly intellectual and firmly clarified as cognitum suggests. We can love someone with whom we're familiar and whom we wish to know much better. For we can also say, nihil vere cognitum nisi prius amatrum, which we might render into English as, unless we love first, we do not truly know. Think about that with people you know, your family, your friends, and also your studies. Unless you love Dante, you can't really know Dante. You've got to fall in love with, with the Divine Comedy before you can really, really begin to understand it. It's this reversal of scholastic theology that Hopkins implicitly risks at the start of the Sestet. When shifting from the recent past to the present, he exclaims, Oh my! Chevalier. The kestrel riding on the air and the blessed soul as a mounted knight. Brute beauty and valour and act, O oh, air pride plume, here buckle. Such diverse elements from distinct regions of being, different ways in which being manifests itself, animal being, empirical features, moral values, actions, human beings, all condensed in the one line are suddenly united in the one place and beheld by Hopkins. Everything comes together in a glimpse of inscape. The Jesuit, who has not met the bird or soul's look, now meets it, and in doing so, knows him in and through love. Yet both gazes, poets and birds, are fundamentally directed toward Christ. Hopkins has not actively anticipated this display of intimacy with Christ in the manner he has, and probably his passive anticipation has not presumed such an encounter either. Surprise and speed precipitate an expression of intense love of Christ, or Christ's minion. Now we may, know, we may well recall the trope of Christ as mounted knight in the anchor and rule, he entered the lists, and for love of his love had his shield pierced on every side of the fight, like a brave knight. We may even remember William Herbert's uh, Franciscan friar, his memorable poem, which is a Christian paraphrase of Isaiah 63, 1-7, in which Christ is regarded as a knight coming back from the battle with Satan after his crucifixion. But I won't read that poem to you. Because the knight that appears in the Windhover is not the Christ of medieval devotion, but the Christian as knight, bound in honour to serve a high ideal that one finds later in Ignatius Loyola. One need not specify particularly Loyola as the Chevalier, though it is tempting to do so. Oh, my Chevalier, my Chevalier, cries the young Jesuit, just months before taking solemn vows as a Jesuit. But the bird asks to be seen as a noble soldier committed in love to serve his Lord. One remembers Ignatius Loyola reading Coberto's The Guard's Preface to Eucorpus de Varenne's Flos Sanctorum of 1511, in which the saints are represented as the knights of God that had such a huge impact upon Loyola. If we refocus on the vehicle of Hopkins' metaphor, the kestrel, we see that the bird exhibits animal beauty, spirit and pride in its act of rapid descent through the air for prey, a descent enabled by its contour feathers, a sense of plume in circulation since the early 19th century. In the one place and time, all these things come together. Indeed, Hopkins affirms the bird's act. The line is an imperative as well as an exclamation is part of what Paul calls being conformed to the image of Christ, and we're left in no doubt that this compliance has a military association. <laughs>
were to buckle on the armour of God, as any Jesuit knows. In that one act, the tremendously fast stoop, the natural and the spiritual momentarily fuse. The kestrel illuminates something of what is possible for a blessed soul. Also in that one act, the limits of the fusion are recognized. No kestrel, no bird of any sort, can support the glory of the divine. The poem urges a structure of double revelation in that being in the kingdom of heaven is like the bird's joy, but also quite unlike it. As in all parabolic utterance, the poem is thrown quickly past what it proposes to illumine, Christ manifesting himself in his kingdom by way of an epiphany, and only one or two facets of the reality can be captured. Oh, Hopkins interjects into his list of elements that are unified in the kestrel swoop on its prey. He's surprised by all that comes together there, and at the same time is delighted by it. If his heart had been hiding from what surprised it, if his heart in hiding had been unwilling to affirm what his eyes have been seeing, now it is engaged. Within three lines we pass from O, O, H, to O, from an interjection to a vocative exclamation. A dedicated chevalier claimed by the votary, Hopkins as his knight, is apostrophized in the midst of its magnificent act. And again we recall the French context and remember that the word chevalier comes from the Middle French of the same period of Mignon and Dauphin. Something else is worth noticing. Three months after composing the Windhover, Hopkins was to write Hurrahing in Harvest, which in its octave declares, I walk, I lift up, I lift up heart, eyes. And two lines later, addresses eyes, heart. Notice how he reverses the order. As to who has actually been seen, namely Christ. Spiritual insight occurs only if perception is preceded and supported by love. Yet once that insight has been attained, the eyes, as the means of understanding what has been seen, are addressed first. So here, in the sestet of the Windhover, the involvement of the heart is presumed in attaining insight into a momentary spiritual and natural fusion that cannot be supported. And then, in what follows, the eyes are privileged. And the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh my chevalier. Hopkins sees the chestnut brown plumage of the kestrel become radiant as it dives, with the sun climbing behind it. And he also sees the light that comes from Christ illuminating and exceeding the blessed soul. So we pass from oculus carnis to oculus contemplationis. The Christ's table light is dazzling far more than created light is well known, but so is the awareness that to follow him is to accept the possibility of martyrdom. The poem that began with unexpected wonder seeks closure by denying that the event just witnessed is indeed surprising. The reason for this deflation, itself quite unexpected, turns on the Jesuits' commitment to a life that is active as well as contemplative, the mixed life that actually aids the Chevalier and the one the Chevalier serves. Here, in the final tercet of the sonnet, Hopkins reflects on the present and past, and the evidence he adduces is recollected. He lowers his eyes to taking two familiar things, ploughing and a home fire. And although the gaze is cast down, it does not shift its attitude. It registers what it sees with phenomenological concreteness, and it also remains oriented to the kingdom rather than the world. The things and events of our workaday life can be contemplated, as Gregory and Richard agree, for they participate in divine grace, even if they are not as spectacular as the flight and abrupt descent of the kestrel. If we reach back to the templum at the heart of contemplation, we can see that auspices of a sort have been given. The realm of the divine manifests itself in ordinary occurrences, giving believers hope for their hard lives even if they share those lives with God. There is not just the one moment of inscape in the poem, 
of various regions of being buckled together, there are three. For even when our eyes are lowered, we can see the shine of the earth and the gold vermilion of the dying fire. I'll end by just pointing out how this is achieved. No wonder of it, sheer plod makes plough down Cillian shine. Once again, we have an English word here, regional, that comes from the French, Sion. The brightness of lumps of soil turned over by the steady handling of a plough is caused by them being cut by the blade. It is not the radiant plumage of the kestrel in its arresting dive, and it cannot support the contemplation of the glorified Christ streaming behind the epiphanic bird. But it is to be valued, nonetheless, for its illumination and consolation. If the display of the kestrel is utterly unexpected and gratuitous, the shining of the soil comes from steady work. The effort of making the plough makes plough down Cillian shine. My emphasis, makes. We are reminded of Jesus' words to a man he encounters on the road. No one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Only if one looks ahead when ploughing the next furrow does one see the Cillian shine by virtue of one's hard work. Only then does it see nature perfected by grace. We might also say, with Gregory and Richard, that we are invited to contemplate what is around us in life as much as the principle and principle of life itself. One of those things, for some people, is the writing of poetry. And while we, romantics or post-romantics, may consider the act of composition sometimes kin to dilatio mentis or sublevatio mentis, or even, if one credits Orphic poets, excessus mentis, we'll also remember that the word verse comes from the Latin versus, meaning a turn of a plough. The poet, Hopkins seems to wink, is at once kestrel and ploughman. Similarly, when bluebeak embers in a fire seem about to be extinguished, yet collapse on those beneath them, they break one another apart and flare with the last of the fire, which when viewed appears profoundly rich, gold vermilion. That last word is itself fertile, for it returns us to ancient Rome, where the pigment was used on frescoes, and recalls the Virgin Mary, who is sometimes associated with the rose of that pigment. Perhaps also it evokes the precious blood of the martyrs who have certainly accepted the cross. Certainly it is the stoop of the kestrel, though in a very minor key. At any rate, physical and spiritual exhaustion can lead to illumination, Hopkins says. The sonnet concludes with one more instant of inscape. It is introduced by the third exclamation of the poem and the most tender of them. Hopkins has sighed Oh, and has raised himself in admiration and awe to sing, Oh, and now, more intimately, he says to the Chevalier, or to Christ himself, Ah. The allusion is to George Herbert's Love, the final lyric of the temple, where the sinful soul, being welcomed into heaven, says, with a heart in hiding, Ah, my dear, I cannot look at thee only to be invited, nonetheless, to the Eucharistic feast, because Christ himself is the one who bore the blame. The illusion nicely answers the penitential foreboding of having a heart in hiding. I emphasize that in reading Hopkins' line, one needs to remember how Herbert continues the stanza, I cannot look on thee. Christ is the dangerous fire streaming from the kestrel, we recall Luke 12, 49. I came to cast fire upon the earth. And yet he is also his close companion in scholarly and pastoral drudgery. It is no wonder that the extraordinary breaks into the ordinary, because that is how Christ, true God and true man, manifests himself, if we only train ourselves to see such things. If the unanticipated spectacle of the dappled kestrel at first points to Christ, so too do other things that we might almost expect. The entire sonnet points to Christ, to different ways of reaching him, as well as being dedicated to him as his finest piece of work to date. 
or so Hopkins might say, quoting Herbert's the 23rd Psalm, that it serves to bring my mind in frame, which is also one of the ends of contemplation. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. Sure. So, um, you know, I'm sorry if you covered this and I missed it, but um, could you give a brief definition of Inkscape? Like, how, how are we supposed to, it's more than just. What, 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 what's the definition of? Uh, Inkscape. Inkscape. Yeah, because it's more than okay. just seeing a thing, right? It's perceiving with order, or there's intelligence. The brief is the brief definitions of Inkscape is the peculiar mixture of the general and the particular, let's say. That's the, that's the absolute basic thing. Everything has many modes of singularity as regards the general and the particular. That would be the briefest of brief accounts. I think it's much more complicated than that because he sees something in SCOTUS that he likes, and he expands upon Scotus using the vocabulary that he already has. And also, he's been drawing on Ruskin that I didn't talk about either. But Ruskin didn't know Scotus. Thank you for your talk. I'm wondering if you could reflect on, unless you don't want to, and you can just set it aside, <laughs> um, this contrast. You mentioned this contrast between Heidegger, who thinks of mood or stimuli mm. uh, as, a, as a form of attunement, but uses particularly sort of dark moods or events as a way into being. Uh, you contrasted that with um, Hopkins' own uh, positivity. I'm wondering if you could sort of put in relationship Hopkins' Par Parmenidean notions of being as a kind of fullness, as this kind of backdrop of fullness over and against um, Heidegger's sense of, of nothingness, that, that some, uh, the, sort of, the sort of nothingness that lies under all, underneath all things is actually a kind of condition for the possibility yeah. of things standing forth phenomenally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if there's some interesting relationship between that going on in Heidegger and, and then again, this sense of, of fullness and plenitude in the top in this permanent Oh, and, yeah. Um, well, for those of you who haven't read much Heidegger yet, Heidegger thinks that moods come over us, and in certain moods, <clears throat> like dread, that moment when you realize, one day, sooner or later, I will die. Or in moments of deep, unrelieved boredom. Then all of the patina of life is stripped away and you see being as it really is. You see human finitude as it is. That's Heidegger's view. And he's drawing that by way of criticism of his master Edmund Husserl, who thought that in order to do philosophy, the philosopher has to will himself or herself into a state of tranquility. Because for him, doing philosophy is a matter of reflection or contemplation. Now, Heidegger thus is evoking non-being, which Parmenides says you can't do, it's forbidden. If there were time, we would look at the various writings that, Hus that Hus Heidegger has on Parmenides, where he reads this poem and tries to make sense of it, and reads it somewhat against the grain in order to get what he wants out of it. But we, we, we can't do that. What I think is most interesting, and I just gestured at this in, in my talk, is Heidegger is very clear as to what moods must come over us in order for us to become philosophical. They're negative, they're wholly negative. Um, angst, deep boredom, shock, surprise, and so forth. All of these things are on the negative psychological part of the spectrum. And he gives no credit whatsoever to what happens to the human being in moments of gratitude, affirmation, joy, pleasure, delight, and so on and so forth. And if you're a student of English poetry, 
or French poetry for that matter, there's many, many poems which are about that, right? And just one's ordinary experience, we all notice, sometimes if you're in a dark mood and something you notice something beautiful in nature, that you can be shifted from your dark mood to an affirmative mood in a, in a moment. Hopkins most interestingly says nothing about the mood that has to come over us in order to detect the instress of something. But I would almost put money on it were I a betting person that they're affirmative moods, namely where you have a heightened perception of something, a heightened perception of a branch of a tree, some grass, a bluebell or something like that, where suddenly you're in an attitude of wonder, of seeing it as miraculous, that here you are looking upon something in the great hierarchy of being that God has made, and if you look at it with a pure heart and attentiveness, you will start to contemplate the creator who made it. Something like that. Now, I'm sandwiching together some of Richard of St. Victor and Hopkins here. I'm putting words into Hopkins' mouth, but I don't think they were ever very far from his mouth. But all of that is most interesting, and one could write an equally long talk about Heidegger on Parmenides and the non-being there, but not today. Yeah? Could you talk a little bit more about your concept of the masters of contemplation? Do they correspond to Paul Rickard's uh, masters of suspicion? Um, yes and no. I mean, the, the, the hermeneutics of suspicion, as you well know, is, which does all kinds of interesting things, says there's always some kind of disparity between the apparent meaning of a text on its surface and the true meaning of a text which is hidden below. And so you uncover usually a political or social significance of a text by doing that. And sometimes that's, that's very persuasive. At other times it's extremely tedious, it seems to be. The hermeneutics of contemplation also has a trio of Coleridge, Schopenhauer, and Husserl and seeks to find a way in which one can open the text to see without prior judgment about social or political issues, without occluding them, of course, but to keep everything in play. So the hermeneutics of suspicion, almost by definition, eliminates religious views, just a priori. You never get to a, a point of depth in Nietzsche or Marx or, or Freud, where everything is illuminated as being created, for example. It's just ruled out a priori. Nothing is ruled out a priori in this. And it brings back many, many opportunities that we have in the tradition for finding layers and layers of meaning, which otherwise we won't see. I mean, I was brought up with the hermeneutics of suspicion as a grad student. And I've been living with it for a very long time and have learnt a lot from those people, but I haven't learnt as much from them as I have from Husserl or Schopenhauer or Coleridge on these. So that's just a very brief little insight into it, but I'm writing on all this right now. Yes? Um, how did Hopkins depart from romanticism? How did he approach romanticism? Yeah, I mean, he had a mixed view of the Romantics. Um, obviously, he was very indebted to certain elements of Romanticism, but he thought that Keats, for example, was effeminate. And you know, he just overly indulged in the play of language. And it was like a bad influence of Milton and, and things like that. You know, too much garlic for breakfast or something. You know, <laughs> there was something s solidly English about Hopkins. And he, he, he wouldn't go for anything which was not virile and manly. Yes? I'm curious about how uh, the concepts of instress and inscape actually translated to Hopkins' um, process of composition. Because it seems to me like those are the moments or, or the kinds of experiences that all authors or writers wait for and wish could happen to them, this kind of moment of illumination. But, um, the trouble, at least I have, um, is that you have this epiphany, and then you you face the um, the challenge of having to translate that to right. actual words and the written page. So, do you know how Hopkins went about doing that? Like, did he write, run around with a notebook 
writing it down as it appeared to him? Or was it in those moments? Well, we have drafts of his poems, including the, the Windhover, which are very interesting to see what he wrote first. And he composed very apparently very swiftly and with most of the poem there, as it were. What I think happens, what is so instructive about him in terms of poetic composition, is that he's attentive to the natural world and the spiritual world all the time. He always seems to have his antenna out, as it, as it were. And you can tell this from his letters and particularly the notebooks and journals. But he's not concerned simply with registering the phenomena of nature, no matter how beautiful they are. One of the interesting things, as I quoted right at the beginning, is his sense of the materiality of language. And one has to capture in poetry the inscape of language. So every poem, the combination of words, is itself an act of inscape. So it's a, it's, this is, a, as we would say in American English, a tall order, right? You've got to capture the glimpse of the, of the instress or inscape, and then you have to do the same thing in the poem in distinctive language. So that it's a double, it's a double act of instress. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.